Master Willem, I've come to bid you farewell. Oh, I know, I know. You think now to betray me. No, but you will never listen. I tell you, I will not forget our adage. We are born of the blood. Made men by the blood. Undone by the blood. Our eyes are yet to open. Fear the old blood. Hello everyone, this is Aegon of Astora, and welcome back to Bloodborne Let's Talk Lore. This is episode 17, being recorded on Sunday, December the 20th, 2015. I hope that you're all having a fantastic day today, uh, whenever it is you find yourself watching this. And also that uh, you are all having a wonderful holiday season, uh, however it is that you go about celebrating that. Uh, what's most important, uh, in my view, is just spending time with family, uh, irrespective of how it is you go about that. So, try and cherish, tr cherish that time with your family, because it is very important. So, um, we are going to use this episode, in spite of the outro teaser that I used in the previous episode, I had originally thought that we would proceed directly into the clinic, but... Um, I've since changed my mind a little bit, uh, just based on the the sheer number of uh, very insightful comments we got with respect to the first area, and the fact that I missed a number of items in the first area of the DLC uh, that I didn't even get after having uh, gone back there in the quote-unquote comments section of the previous episode. So... Uh, I've still, in fact, not even received the trophy yet for having gotten all of the uh, weapons from the DLC. So, uh, we're going to try and uh, get all of that stuff, and hopefully get our hands on the trophy eventually. Uh, and then we are going to go and uh, talk about and fight Lawrence, the first vicar. Uh, but first and foremost, I wanted to acknowledge a comment that I received from Aaron who writes that Valter has a belt torch on his waist, uh, and he notes that he used to have one that is very similar. So, I'm satisfied with that. That's very interesting. Um, you'll also note that right here on the top, it seems almost like, and, and it could just be that that's the model stretching with his breathing animation, and in fact it looks very much like that is the case, but it looks almost like a clamshell opening and closing. But I imagine that's just, yeah, the model's not supposed to do that, but since the breathing animation uh, takes it in particular directions, that that's uh, the end result. But insofar as we do accept that it is a belt torch, um, yeah, it's just very interesting. I, I suppose that that's meant to signify that he is very much an old hunter, with an emphasis on the old because, of course, if you look at us, we have the Hand Lantern, which seems, at least at first glance, to be a fair bit more modern. Uh, I'm not sure whether Hand Lanterns are even actually a thing. So, um, you know, I don't know to what extent we can actually look to historical evidence to determine uh, the vintage of each respective item. But it seems to suggest that he's a hunter from an earlier time, and I'm not sure if it goes very far beyond that. Ah, how goes your hunt? Do not forget the League's mission. To cooperate with Confederates, find vermin, and stamp them out. Okay, so off camera I've done a couple things uh, in preparation for this episode starting off here. And uh, the first thing is that... Now I thought I had five vermin. 
In which case, it would appear as though I'm not, in fact, ready. Whoops. Ah, very good. You've crushed some vermin. <laughs> I'm the master of the League, I can see it in your eyes. I'm pleased. This makes you a true fellow of the League. A confederate. Now, take this stuff. A symbol of our oath. Of our blood-drenched fate. You'll be welcomed as a true confederate. Go forth with renewed vigour. In short time, you will see how the mission takes hold of one's spirits. So my original plan was to crush that one vermin to get the um, to get our hands on the league staff, and then and then to crush four additional vermin so that we could trigger the next phase of his quest line. Uh, because Aaron, uh, in his comments, left a very interesting way of explaining what it is that happens. Uh, but it looks like we're going to have to discuss that in the next episode, uh, unless I. Oh, actually, no, in fact, we won't. Uh, we should be able to come back here uh, later on, because there are enemies in the first area of the DLC that we have not killed that will drop vermin. So perhaps that's what I was thinking by only uh, getting a few of them. So here we have the younger, or no, is this the younger? I believe this is the younger of the two Madaris twins. I was just reading my new uh, uh, Old Hunter's Guide by Future Press and made note of which one it was, but for some reason didn't add it to my show notes here, so... Now it says that he's uh, the young, insofar as I'm remembering this correctly, that he's the younger of the two. Uh, the fact that they're twins, I'm not really sure how relevant it is that one is older and younger. Because they were both, yeah, so I don't know. But, because yeah, he looks a fair bit aged. He's aged a fair bit, so... So I used the trap there just to ensure that uh, I, I knew that he didn't have any actual drops, but also to show uh, those of you out there who may, have, may be having trouble with him how it is that you can go about dealing with him. Another way you can deal with him is by uh, leading him to the elevator. And uh, he and you know going down the elevator, he will almost assuredly follow you down there and then fall to his death. So gravity is always a valid way of dealing with enemies like him. So now that we've taken out the younger of the Madaris twins, we can have a look at the Madaris whistle. Summon a giant serpent from the nightmare. Whistle of the Madaris twins, denizens of the forbidden woods. The twins grew up alongside a poisonous snake and developed a silent, inhuman kinship. The poisonous snake grew uncontrollably, raised on a healthy diet of beast entrails. Even after their deaths, it is said to respond to the call of the twins' whistle from within the nightmare. So that's pretty cool. Pretty, pretty cool. Uh, and also worthy of note that the Shadows of Yarnum, Yarnum seem to summon the same snake, or at least a very similar one, to the one that we've just summoned there. So I don't know what that means, if anything. Yeah. 
And also from Volter, we picked up the League Staff. Uh, league Staff hides a direct relisting of the names of League Confederates. The League Staff is the sign of a Confederate. A directory within the hilt lists the names of fellow Confederates. Members of the League brandish this staff to indicate themselves to me fellow members of the League. There shall be no sympathy for those engaged in the bloody mission of the League. No matter that, an oath must be taken to uphold the illusion. And of course it comes with this somewhat problematic gesture. That, yeah. So we're gonna do something a little bit different today. And the reason for that is that uh, I did actually spend some time uh, reading and recording, making note of comments that previously, I usually record the first part of the episode uh, with only one or two comments in mind, and then I collect the remaining comments uh, and deal with the comment section uh, either the next day or the day after, after recording uh, the gameplay itself. Uh, but what I did for this episode was I actually went through and, um, yeah, uh, gathered together several comments that we will be trying to address as we go through the gameplay portion uh, of revisiting this area and uh, looking for the things that we missed, um, while also drawing attention to a number of very interesting things that came up. Uh, the first of which comes from Cassative, uh, who goes by the name Theomeni on Twitch, uh, and who was uh, present for much of the blind playthrough, and who I didn't mention explicitly in the last episode, though I did add an annotation, uh, is I believe the person to first raise the idea of post-traumatic stress disorder in the context of the hunter's nightmare, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, first I wanted to draw attention to the sun that I've been so enamored with since we started playing, uh, since the very moment uh, we warped into the hunter's nightmare and we walked out and we looked here. And so Cassative writes, uh, I was thinking about the Shattered Sun while co-op helping Ludwig, and a thought came to me that was so obvious as to be overlooked while I was playing through the DLC myself. The Shattered Sun isn't a sun at all. It's the iris of an eye, with the other one being the astral clock tower's face itself. Notice how the shattered bits of the sun mirror the stri striations in eye color and of itself, as does the metalwork on the clock face from behind. Immediately I think that this is the curse of Kos or Kossum watching the nightmare, or perhaps it is the consciousness of Kos or Kossum herself, staring down at the nightmare with a baleful eye. And we also received another comment from uh, Chief Rides uh, about a week after um, Theomany's comment, which reads, The sun isn't a sun at all. It looks like a broken iris, exact copy from my biology book. So I, I sent a reply to Chief Rides asking what the name of the condition was that, that uh, he or she was referencing. I didn't receive a reply, so I basically just googled broken iris and came up with a condition that is called uh, posterior sinichia, posterior sinichia, um, which I don't have the side-by-side -side on my screen right in front of me, but I can certainly see the resemblance. Um, in which case, sure, very interesting. Uh, it's also worth noting that uh, the Orphan of Kos, before you fight them, uh, him presumably, given uh, the voice and sound effects that we hear, uh, before we fight him, yeah, you see him just he just kind of stands there and before you cross a certain threshold he doesn't move he just stands there and stares at the sun so in that sense making eye contact with someone or something um, though I'm not sure what to make of it beyond that uh, it's also worth noting that we do enter the DLC from the eye of a blood drunk hunter so I don't know you could think of that maybe as a portal of some sort that we've been shrunk down in a way, and I don't think the nightmares um, necessarily follow the same rules of time and space that uh, we are bound to in the waking world. So I'm not sure if shrunk down 
is really an appropriate way, uh, you know, a relative way of talking about it. But I thought it was just an interesting thought. So yeah, uh, I will stand corrected on this being a sun. Certainly it looks like a sun, um, but it would seem to also be doubling as an eye of sorts. So now we're going to move on and hope that I am somehow able to acquire all of the weapons that I so obliviously missed. I stop and watch that just about every time. Because, yeah, it so powerfully conveys so much about, of what the DLC is actually about. And I probably should have gone through before I started recording and made, made note of where the items are that I missed. But... There's going to be a lot of uh, momentary excitement before I actually realize that, yeah, it's just something like Frenzied Cold Blood or whatever. But I can see one up there. And as we proceed and we notice other things, uh, or I notice other things that remind me of comments that I've received, I'm going to stop and, yeah, read out the comments and we'll discuss them as we go along. Uh, this guy is very, very interesting in that notice first that his weapon has kind of a dark abyssal substance that when he swings it, you see the substance just kind of... It leaves a trail. And recall also that I mentioned in the previous episode that right there, you just saw it right there, that he seems to have a form of quickening. Come on, friend. Show off your fancy trick, please. So I have no idea what to make of that. Um, the guide, unfortunately, does not really offer all that much insight, at least from what I've read of it and from what I've heard from Redgrave. Uh, it doesn't really offer all that much insight in terms of the enemy names. So unfortunately we're not going to get very much from there, but just the fact that, yeah, he seems to use an abyssal abyssal form of quickening whereby he you know when he dashes he seems to come in and out of darkness his weapon moreover has some sort of abyssal abyssal substance that comes off of it that le it leaves a trail when he swings the weapon so i'm not sure what to make of all of this beyond the fact that ludwig of course seems to have in some way, shape, or form, uh, seems to have made a pact with an abyss of sorts with the tiny dancing sprites, and that's something we're going to talk about a lot more, but it, it just struck me that there's a, even more um, similarities and parallels between Ludwig and Artorius uh, beyond the simple fact that 
uh, of, of Koi Pop's prediction earlier on in this playthrough that there's so much about Ludwig that seems to be missing and that we'll probably be learning about him in future DLC. So yeah, I'll leave that with each of you, but I just thought it was, it's almost as though this old hunter, and so the guy, the guy does refer to these enemies, the ones that don't leave a corpse. They're referred to as old hunters. And so, uh, perhaps they were once Garman's apprentices, uh, among Garman's apprentices, and that they learned quickening, as did, uh, and again, it's a natural quickening. It's not an artificial quickening like the Bloody Crow of Canehurst uses, or that the player character uses, where you squeeze the bone, and then you can use quickening. Uh, it's, an, it's a natural quickening, but it also seems to be a corrupted quickening. Perhaps having something to do with Ludwig and the fact that the old hunters, yeah, followed Ludwig. So, but I don't know. It's very interesting, though. So that's where we got the old hunter trousers. So we don't need to go there again. And this guy does not have that same form of quickening. So, I don't know. It, it seems to only be that one old hunter. And so here we come once again to this same set piece that I talked about in the previous episode. And so this seemed like a good spot to go over some other comments that we received. Uh, the first one from 12 is a letter, who writes uh, that maybe the bloody remains and the half-living skeletons we find in the nightmare are the beasts that were slain by hunters in the waking world. Perhaps those who succumbed to the bloodlust and beasthood uh, before being pulled into the nightmare were manifested there in a death as a way to torment their comrades whom still, uh, for whom still drove the hunt on. After all, it is their remains that feeds the river of blood. So that part of the comment we're going to talk about once we reach Ludwig's boss room again. Uh, but he also writes, on that note, I think the reason the beasts cower from you in the hunter's nightmare is because, well, they're rightfully terrified of you. They are trapped in this nightmare too, doomed to be hunted down, maimed, burned, torn asunder by blood-crazed madmen. That being said, it raises some interesting questions about Eileen's dialogue about beasts having no fear in their hearts. There are no humans left. They're all flesh-hungry beasts now. Still lingering about. What's wrong? A hunter unnerved by a few beasts. <laughs> no matter. Without fear in our hearts, we're little different from the beasts themselves. And on that comment, uh, Centimeter Worm replied to say, I always thought of that particular dialogue from Eileen to be more a reflection of her own attitude towards the beast, seeing them as flesh-hungry hung monsters, essentially, and not necessarily a profound observation on the true nature of a beast. Remember, she's a hunter of hunters. How many of her fellow hunters and friends, taken and twisted by the scourge, has she put down already? It seems only natural that she'd be very cynical and harsh towards these deformed beasts, perhaps as a way of coping with the death she meets out on a regular basis. And Passy re uh, replied in turn to that comment, saying, Yeah, I think Ludwig talking and still possessing some of his humanity, as well as the afflicted beggar, shows that the victims of the Scourge are in fact still aware and have some humanity left within them. So this is something that we talked about very early on, but we've kind of gone away from, and that is the how blurry and porous the line is separating uh, man and beast. And I see an item over there that we've not yet grabbed. So we'll go grab that in a second. But first, we'll just take this guy out. So that also raises another question about... Whose consciousnesses are here? Which consciousnesses are actually being reflected here? And which are just constructs of the nightmare? 
Damn it. <laughs> I was hoping that would be another item we missed. Alright, um... So all of this leads me to another comment we received from the folklorist, who writes, I was under the impression that the beasts are holding their hands up, not in fear of a torch or due to a bug, but because they are terrified of the hunters. They too are in the nightmare, and there are quite a lot of hunters after them. We And we know from the NPC dialogue that beasts are more intelligent than they appear to be at first glance. Imagine being a weaker beast in the hunter's nightmare. Everyone there is either forced to hunt or be hunted forever for something they themselves did not do. And these beasts, I experimented with them for quite a while. Even though they do retain the same charging animation that their uh, counterparts do in the waking, have in the waking world, where they charge you and then attack you, uh, they are completely non-aggressive. If you hit them, they will, of, of course, tr attempt to defend themselves. But if you get in the middle of them, as I just did, they sort of follow you around the level. It's really strange. And, yeah, this led me to just think a lot about what it is that we're seeing. And to question whether or not these are beasts that were these beasts are the have the consciousness of people who were turned into beasts or who you know succumbed to the scourge and that they too were somehow pulled into the nightmare i don't think that's what's happening here i think that these beasts while they may correspond to real people uh like the the representation of them I don't think that the consciousnesses of these beasts is are, are trapped within the nightmare. I think this is just a representation of it, a recreation, if you will, that reflects on. You can see this this hunter over there was just hurting them, and but again, they're completely non-aggressive. So what I think we're seeing here is that the hunter's nightmare is in a sense, as as I kind of posited in the previous episode, a representation of hundreds and hundreds and thousands of old hunters, of their memories, of their traumatic memories. Because recall that the Beast Cleaver says that uh, that the hunts of the earliest hunters made for horrific affairs painted in sanguine blacks and reds. And so this would seem, at least to me, to be a memory or a, a, an amalgamation of memories of the trauma that the first hunters went through when hunting these beasts who had recently turned into beasts who had recently crossed whatever the line is that separates man and beast. And that this is how the earliest beasts responded when they came across hunters. They didn't know what to do. They were frightened. Uh, they were and still are to some degree human. And here are these humans coming and hunting them down. As though, you know, it was some something that they did. And so this created, and again, this is a uh, an idea that Theomeni raised, and that I, at the time, wasn't sure what to think about it, but I've, I've spent a great deal of time thinking about it since then. Um, that, and here's another, another, and so I wonder the extent to which, how many of, and there's another hunter, all of these players just thoughtlessly slaughtering these beasts. And no offense to you if you're one of those players, but it is a very interesting thing. Let's see what this note says. Time for singing. Sure. Are you suggesting that we try the music box? Oh, that would have been really cool if that actually worked. Um... And so, yeah, you can see they kind of follow you. So, here's what Theomeni said about the beast patients specifically. 
Most of them, I think, are pulled from the universal hunter consciousnesses and, and made to be afraid of them. This echoes Jura's comments that the beast patients, uh, Old Yarnum is where we first see them, won't harm anyone. It's the hunter who is the true beast and the patients are pleading for mercy that they won't get. So, we could look at least at this first area of the hunter's nightmare as sort of the, the manifestation of the hunter, the first hunter's collective PTSD. Um, because one of the symptoms of PTSD, as I, re I remember it, uh, in my brief reading on the subject, and I'm not an expert by any means, but that you have recurring memories of your trauma, of whatever the, the, the trauma traumatic event is that led you to have the post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, such that it's the worst possible punishment that someone with PTSD can have to be forced in perpetuity to relive your trauma. And so for the old hunters that are here, that is precisely what is happening. They are being forced to relive over and over and over again. The trauma that was becoming a hunter for the first time and being forced to hunt beasts who are helpless and essentially begging for mercy. So yeah, pretty grim, but I, I, I like the way that that kind of ties everything together in the first area. And so I, I'm full on uh, against the idea that this is merely just a glitch. This, this seems to me, especially when we look at the beast patients on the roof over there it seems almost uh, almost a silly it, it's almost silly to suggest that this is just a bug in my view and see they're following us now which is bad because of course we have a trap that's going to be triggered up there Beast, I'm sorry. Oh no, they survived it! Looks like they survived it. Good job, fellas. So this guy, it was confirmed, is a nightmare executioner, uh, according to the guide. Good job, fellas. Just stay back for a second, let me deal with this guy up here. Okay, they're still good. They're still good. Wait, they might have lost one of them. Hold on. Hold on, fellas. No. Guys, what happened? I'm sorry. Guys, we're just gonna go talk about the about Lawrence a little bit. So if you don't want to come in the cathedral, you can just hang out here. I'll be back, okay? If I could drop blood vials or something for you, I would. <laughs> okay. So first, we have a comment on Lawrence from Twelve Is a Letter, who writes, um, "You know, I don't really know what to think." about the Lawrence the First Vicar battle for a couple of reasons. First, probably the most important character of the game, the character uh, who is responsible for all the events we hear about and all the events we participate in, is just a reskinned cleric beast. Um, I don't know if 12 is a letter meant that in a pejorative sense, because generally when you're speaking about a boss as being a reskin, it's, it's not a good thing. 
But I don't think that there's any problem with Lawrence being a cleric beast, uh, personally. And especially considering the fact that the fight is, is vastly different to that of the cleric beast. Uh, I believe Richard Pillbeam or Gilles Saint Frontier in the chat when I was fighting Lawrence for the first time, I believe he compared it to uh, that it's it's almost like the difference between the Asylum Demon and the Demon Fire Sage. And I would say to a degree that that's, that's an apt comparison, except that in my limited time fighting Lawrence, and my, my uh, numerous attempts fighting the Cleric Beast, I think that there's more of a difference between them than that of the difference between uh, the Asylum Demon and Demon Fire Sage. And that's uh, Dark Souls 1 reference for anyone who doesn't recognize those names. Uh, but second, 12 is a letter writes, We find Lawrence's human skull in the other Nightmare Cathedral, yet the boss still has its head. The item description clearly states that the human skull only exists in the Nightmare, so it can't be the skull of the real Lawrence. One would think that his body wouldn't have a head if his skull can be found elsewhere in the nightmare, unless the Lawrence's skull key item is only a sculpture of what his human skull would have looked like if he died a man. I don't know, it's got me all a jumble. I think you're not the only one there in 12's letter. <laughs> the only thing I can figure out is maybe the boss we fight isn't Lawrence at all, but a nightmare representation of him. The same way the cityscapes and landmarks are represented, that is, it's not Lawrence's physical body or conscious form, but the idea of him conjured by the nightmare. I think I'm thinking way too much about this. <laughs> I don't know if you're thinking way too much about it, but but certainly it is confusing. Um, I will say that I do think that this... I don't know about the fire aspect of it, but certainly I think that Lawrence... This is probably what he would have looked like uh, when he still in the waking world existed as a beast. I think he looked, yeah, probably a lot like the cleric beast. Uh, the reskinned aspect of it, quote unquote, the, the fire aspect, I don't know if that's something that, if that's a characteristic that he had as a beast, um, because recall that the it said, as it was, clerics transformed into the most hideous beasts. So, perhaps the extent of the hideousness has something to do with the amount of power or, or you know, how, how revered the specific cleric is. So the, that would make, you know, the cleric beast wasn't an especially revered cleric, but Lawrence, of course, was. The next comment we have is from uh, Der Leichen Soldat, who writes, uh, that he's upset about Lawrence not being the bloodletting beast. It just made so much sense to him. However, Lawrence melting his legs away is super cool twist on the cleric beast in my opinion, even though it kind of makes the fight tedious. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see how well we're able to do against uh, Lawrence in this playthrough. Uh, Jared Taylor mentions that um, the wounds on the bloodletting beast, particularly the open skull and the back wound, match up really close with the open holes in Lawrence, the first vicar. It was harder to tell in my initial fight with him, but in subsequent fights with summons helping, I had some breathing room to notice that he has a, he has flame jets coming out of a hole on the left side of his skull, and his back has flames pouring out of a very large open area as well. I think at this point it's pretty irrefutable that the bloodletting beast is Lawrence. So it's not a given. It's, it's not a that Lawrence is not the bloodletting beast. The only issue I would have with that idea now is that there has to be some way to explain the different appearance of the cleric beast and the or of uh, Lawrence first vicar and the bloodletting beast. I believe that the bloodletting beast is a fair bit larger and rather than having silverish hair um, and flames of course the bloodletting beast has really dark is covered in really dark beast hair so again maybe this is maybe that's the difference between the representation of Lawrence in the nightmare and his actual physical appearance as a beast although a further caveat to that would be that the we fight the bloodletting beast only in the chalice dungeons which is perhaps a closer 
approximation of what Lawrence actually looked like? I don't know. But it's very interesting. I'm looking forward to hearing what each of you have to say. Uh, the Lord Magmar did have a theory about why Lawrence is on fire. Um, and he writes that it, it's because he's the reason for the burning of old Yarnum. He transformed and the church burnt everything down to cover it up. And he says this because the Hunter's Nightmare first area has a bunch of male beast patients and a blood-starved beast. Also, the enemy hunters seem to be using powder cake weapons and styles. Plus, on the night of the burning uh, red eyes would be very visible to anyone seeing them walk through the town. My guess is that Ludwig ordered the burning to protect the healing church, and the river of corpses is a representation of the innocents killed by Ludwig the Accursed slash Holy Blade, who has two titles. One of those, uh, he's a hero, and one from the victims of his zealous hunting. So, very interesting. Um, it is worth noting that, yeah, the, the red-eyed beast patients, if I recall correctly, in the Waking World, I believe we only run into them in Old Yarnum. So, if we're to uh, continue to accept the proposition that the red-eyed beast patients are the ones for whom... Uh, and I think we've still missed an item over here, so we're going to do a little bit more exploring in this area before we move on. But I believe that Old Yarnum is the only place that uh, we find the Red Eye Beast patients, and the only place uh, that seemingly was struck with the Ashen Blood. Oh no, where did our friends go? I guess they went back to their spot. Let's make sure they're all right. Yeah, they're good. They're good. Okay, we'll leave them. We'll leave them be. We won't force them to follow us again. Okay, it does look like we've picked everything up in that first area. And if I haven't, and there's something that you know I've missed, I sincerely apologize for that. First, we're going to deal with these turrets. And then we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, amygdala here. So I knew that I was probably missing something by just running right by this thing. We received a very interesting comment that which uh, more or less confirmed that from uh, first from Sam Newman who writes a note on the amygdalin arm. The weapon does not seem to be a full arm but rather the inner structure of a hand. The weapon has a single extended finger and a mass of cartilage or bone that corresponds roughly to the hand, or maybe further up the limb of the amygdala. Um, this helps to deal with the skill issue in comparison to the, the amygdalae we that we encounter in the game. Interestingly enough, the petrified amygdalin corpse is roughly sitting on top of the cave that the blood-starved beast inhabits. And the location of the arm, if you look closely, you can see that one of its arms falling into the crevice behind it. Also, that much blood and he is blood, still blood starved? Greedy, greedy bugger, referring to the blood starved beast in the cave. So, just looking from up here, that proposition that the amygdala arm that we pick up belonged to this amygdala makes a heck of a lot of sense. And so, I did want to verify that that is indeed the case, but it, it does look very much as though it lines up. But let's go double check that.
And, yep, Sam Newman appears to be 100% correct. And that is just fascinating. And really, really a brilliant piece of game design. That, yeah, the amygdalan arm we pick up. And let's see... Although, it does seem like we still pick it up from a corpse. Yeah, this is the corpse that we picked it up from. And so there's no signs of it jutting through the top of the cave here. But I still really, really like that idea. And it seems almost certainly that that's what the designers intended by putting that uh, ashen amygdalan corpse up there. And I knew that there had to be something significant to it, but I hadn't made the connection uh, geographically. So thank you, Sam Sam Newman, for uh, pointing that, that out, because that's a brilliant insight, really. And we also had another comment about the Ash and Amygdala Corpse from a user named High Endurance Ludes. And we are going to uh, discuss that a little bit later on because it requires us bringing a fair bit of uh, other information to bear on that subject. So uh, it's something that, yeah, we're going to discuss probably in the comment section to this episode and, and perhaps a little bit more later on. Constable's Gloves. Once upon a time, a troop of foreign constables chased the beast all the way to Yarnum, and this is what they wore. So it's, it's essentially the same as the rest of the constable set, but good to know that uh, we found another item that we were missing previously. Yep, there's an item. That did not work out. Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> we did it constable's garb yep same item description and I see another item down there that we obviously missed and another red-eyed hunter
So let's see if he too has some form of abyssal quickening, as I've taken to calling it. The abyssal substance is definitely coming off of his weapon, but... He's still yet to dash. No, his dashes are normal. He hits like a truck. Oh no! He had that same, that same dash attack. So he's got the same abyssal quickening. That is fascinating. And vermin. Beast Hunter Staff. A trick weapon used by the old hunters. A second blade is found inside the curve of the main one. In its initial form, the scythe can be wielded like a long curved sword, but when transformed, its blade is contracted, allowing for quick, repeated stabs. Although this trick weapon allows for adaptive combat, it was later replaced by saws and similar weapons that were more effective at disposing of beasts. Alright, so I think that's all the items we missed in the first area. I could be wrong about that. And if I am, I'm sure some or all of you will let me know. I don't know if I'm entirely prepared to talk about the executioners just yet. Uh, beyond a comment we had about Ludwig's boss room, which we will get to in just a minute. So we received a comment from the folklorist who writes that uh, he or she believes that the pile of corpses uh, were supposed to signify the amount of people who died due to the actions of the church and misguided hunters. So these, these corpses that we find everywhere, and I think that that's a rather apt explanation. Uh, and that the river of blood represents, uh, of course, by extension, that the River of Blood represents the, just, yeah, the bloodshed, the early nights of the hunt. These are all the human lives that were lost and seemingly discarded through no fault of their own after being uh, subjected to blood ministration. So someone pointed out in a comment that I kept this guy alive. And I I honestly had to, after I received that comment, I had to look around the boss room and realize that, yes, indeed, uh, this guy wasn't just part of a cutscene. That you can somehow keep him alive. He doesn't say much, I'm led to understand, but let's see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And that's the same laughing sound that we hear uh, prior to the boss fight. And so I'm just thinking that perhaps the, the corpses coming up out of the ground and then falling back in, and this guy is in particular, meant perhaps to signify this thing that we've been discussing for much of the episode, that the line between man and beast is pretty blurry. That there's nothing that says that beasts have to, that they have no consciousness, that they have no fear in their hearts. These are all just corpses. And the source, uh, the source of the river is right here. It's a river of blood. The source of it was Ludwig and the corpse pile that he was responsible for creating. <laughs> so, yep. And Simon's here as well. at Ludwig's corpse, or his head at least. A tragic figure, but he will shame himself no longer. He died with his ideals untarnished. He was a true hero, and earned that much at least. Do you know why the hunters are drawn to this nightmare? Because it sprouted from their very misdeeds. Things that some would rather keep secret. A pitiful tale of petty arrogance, really. High time someone exposed the whole charade. Now, now, go on ahead. You seek nightmares, and the secrets within, do you not? So as for Ludwig himself, uh, we got a couple of interesting comments. Uh, the first from Wolfie294, who writes that, uh, can we safely confirm uh, Ludwig being an executioner. He has a tattered executioner cape on his model. Uh, so I've not been able to confirm that myself, uh, mostly because when I'm fighting I'm usually just focused on the fight itself. Uh, but this was confirmed by several other people as well in the comments. Um, and we also had one from uh, Ibis Alvarez who writes, what I can see is that Ludwig used a horse during the hunt so that the, that thing he's fused with is probably his horse. You can actually see a lot of dead horses in Yarnum, even in Kanehurst, and the sounds he makes is evidence of that. And so the horses are something that I've never been able to actually place, like what their significance is, or if there is even any at all. And it would seem that, yeah, perhaps uh, the earliest hunters, uh, that they rode horses on their hunts. So, yeah. That's pretty cool. So thank you, uh, Ivis, for that. And it's kind of a gruesome way to punish him, I guess. But given, once again, the fact that this boss room is the source of the river, the river of blood, you can see it's flowing from the boss room throughout the rest of the Hunter's Nightmare. So it seems pretty clear that the blame is laid, just justly or otherwise, on Ludwig for the sheer amount of death and bloodshed uh, perpetrated during the early hunt. Shrouded by night, but with steady strife. Followed by blood, but always clear of mind. Ground under the church. Beasts are a curse, and a curse is a shackle. Only the true blade to the church. 
So that is Yanamura the Hunter, and we will of course be returning to talk about him later on. as well as Brayden, the church assassin. Are you a hunter? Well, that's very odd. Do you hear the toll of the bell? Very well. The beast you seek will not be found here. Go back to your hunt, and if you have the chance, put this knife behind you. Places better left untouched. Secrets better left alone. Only a forward so brazenly roam. I believe it's actually Braidor. The reason I said Braden is because we have a comment from Braden Keat who points out that the two church doctors guarding the elevator uh, leading up to the uh, research hall, uh, that they are chanting the Seek the Old Blood prayer that we first heard being recited by Vicar Amelia uh, when we first entered the Grand Cathedral. Shrouded by nine. Fist of Gratia. A chunk of iron fitted with finger holes. The hulking hunter woman, Simple Gratia, ever hopeless when hand handling hunter firearms, preferred to knock the lights out of beasts with this hunk of iron, which incidentally caused heavy stagger. Gratia was a fearsome hunter, and to onlookers, her unrelenting pummeling appeared oddly heroic. No wonder this weapon later assumed her name. So given the size of the woman described, and the size of this unique corp corpse model here, we are led to assume that this is Gratia herself. It sounds like she was pretty awesome. You can see, much like Vicar Amelia, uh, where we find her in the Grand Cathedral, this hunter is just kind of sitting there praying at the altar. And we also find here some rats with glowing eyes. So this is something I raised during the blind playthrough live stream. Uh, the The connection between this scene here and uh, a book that I've been reading as part of my comprehensive examinations, or a book I've read, I should say, uh, called Making Mice, whereby the question is raised, why, why mice? Why are laboratory mice a thing? Why not laboratory anything else? Why are mice used as an analog for... Uh, you know, mice or rat physiology as an analog for human physiology or as a proxy. Um, and the answer, at least in part, is quite simply that because they are viewed as vermin, as pests, that you can do things to their bodies that you can't to, you know, animals that we regard uh, more favorably. And of course, you can't do these things to humans. So given where we are, the research hall, 
and given the prevalence of eyes throughout Bloodborne in, you know, in terms of experimentation, uh, it seems pretty obvious that these rats here were the subject of experiments uh, meant seemingly to, you know, perhaps, uh, although it doesn't seem to fit at the same time because um, the healing church, of course, was seeking the old blood as opposed to fearing it. Fearing the old blood was uh, Bergenworth's motto. So perhaps this was as far as they could get with avoiding the old blood? That they too were trying to see, okay, maybe there's something to what Willem was saying about uh, having eyes on the inside, that we need more eyes. And that, you know, this was the best that their experiments could muster. Just some rats with eyes, you know, like this. And that it didn't really do much else other than have them glowing. So, I don't know. But I thought that the parallel was interesting and worth mentioning anyway. They don't seem to have any special powers beyond just glowing eyes. So I'll let you listen to the sound of the prayer as we approach. And you can hear that in, in stark contrast to Vicar Amelia's uh, uh, when Vicar Amelia recites the prayer. This one is a fair bit more hesitant, and uh, whichever of the two doctors are reciting it, I'm assuming it's the one sitting at the altar uh, in the white, and that the uh, Holy Blade, Ludwig's Holy Blade, that is watching the other church doctor, I'm assuming that that doctor is just there as a bodyguard of sorts. Uh, and also notice that these beds are a fair bit nicer looking than any of the other ones we come across that are being used in blood ministration throughout the game, indicating perhaps that these beds were used to treat members of the church as opposed to just, you know, high-ranking members of the church as opposed to just anybody. And this corpse model is wearing a healing church, uh, healing church hunter garb has Great One's Wisdom on it. So the Shaman Bone Blade didn't work out quite as well as I had imagined it would, but still much better than it did during my blind playthrough. I 
did receive a comment from someone suggesting that I put the uh, the monocular on my personal effects. But the problem with that is that in order to stop looking through the monocular, you have to select your personal effects and then hit it from there again. And I find that that causes more confusion than it uh, alleviates. So this is something that... Uh, I did receive a comment from someone to this effect, but I'm not sure if I have it here, where someone questioned uh, Redgrave's conclusion that this guy in the middle here with the large hat, that that is uh, Master Willem. I, I also am skeptical or at least uncertain as to whether or not this is Master Willem. Note also that there is a beast under the table here, and that all three of them are wearing surgical long gloves. And recall that the description for the surgical long gloves states that white surgical gloves, the intricate embroidery, weaves a spell that protects their wearer. The church engages in the hunt in a medical capacity. When a cancer is discovered, one must pinpoint its location, reach in, and wrench it from the host's bosom. So it doesn't make any mention of Bergenworth. I don't know why Master Willem would be wearing the personal effects or, you know, a part of the church uniform. And perhaps the surgical long gloves were first used at Bergenworth and then adopted by the church. But, you know, we have no evidence to suggest at least from the item descriptions, that that is indeed the case. And perhaps, I guess, where we should uh, be focusing our attention is on the headdress, and whether or not this, in fact, uh, is similar to that which Master Willem himself uses. So we'll have to look at that a little bit more closely. So given the amount of time we have left in this episode, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint any of you who were hoping that I would get to the research hall today, uh, but unfortunately we are not going to have the time to do that. But instead, what we're going to do is we're going to send this elevator back up, and we are going to have a look at Lawrence's skull here, which we uh, one of the comments earlier raised the, you know, issues with this being here and how complicated and kind of confusing it is. This seems uh, to be almost a carbon copy of the altar that we find in the Grand Cathedral proper in the Waking World. Except with a human skull instead of a beast skull there. Lawrence's skull, Skull of Lawrence, first vicar of the Healing Church. In reality, he became the first cleric beast and his human skull exi only exists within the nightmare. The skull is a symbol of Lawrence's past and what he failed to protect. He is destined to seek his skull, but even if he found it, it could never restore his memories. So another similarity to the Artorias of the Abyss DLC that was raised, I believe, by... Um, I believe it was, again, by uh, Richard or Jusant Frontier, and that is... The skull seems almost to operate in the same way that Manus's pendant, the broken pendant, did in Dark Souls 1. Whereby it doesn't necessarily mean anything, but he's he's destined or forced almost to just 
constantly seek it. It's a symbol of his lost humanity that he, he longs for. He yearns for it. Church Cannon An oversized weapon used by the Healing Church. A type of cannon that fires with a curved trajectory and creates an explosion upon impact. Originally designed for use by brawny men with deteriorated brains, not just for any ordinary hunter. But the men lacked the wits to effectively operate firearms, and the weapon was quietly ushered into permanent storage. So that doesn't explain why the Nightmare Executioners are using it, or perhaps it does, because perhaps the real Executioners were not intelligent enough to use it, and that the Nightmare Executioners are, but only because they're in the Nightmare. That I'm not really sure of. So we have one last piece of business to deal with in this episode, and that is uh, ridding the Nightmare, at least temporarily, of Lawrence the First Vicar. So let's go take care of that. Of course, it bears mentioning that had I gone and used the other vermin in front of Valter, we're going to have to do that in the next episode, but had I done so, we would have had a summon sign there for Beast Eater Valter, or Valter the Beast Eater, so very interesting.
Beast's Embrace. After repeated experiments in controlling the Scourge of Beasts, the gentle Embrace rune was discovered. When its implementation failed, the Embrace became a forbidden rune, but this knowledge became a foundation of the Healing Church. Those who swear this, this oath take on a ghastly form and enjoy accentuated transformation effects, especially while wielding a beast weapon. So as for the fight itself, I do find it very interesting and sort of tragic, the, the final phase of the fight, beyond being extraordinarily annoying from a gameplay perspective. Uh, and that's why you saw, uh, essentially my strategy for the third phase is just to mash R1 as quickly as possible. Uh, and get in as much, like, just focus on DPS above everything else. Uh, but yeah, I do just find it tragic how it, it reminds me almost, almost of uh, the great Grey Wolf Sif, from, again from Dark Souls 1, how he starts to kind of fall over a little bit, he loses his mobility halfway through the boss fight. And the same seems to happen to Lawrence for one reason or another. So yeah. So note that even though we hear someone sleeping, we see the doll standing upright here. And the reason I'm pointing this out is that we received the comment from Xenu Orion on uh, the video where I last pointed out the sound of someone sleeping that occurs every now and then when you warp into the hunter's dream. And uh, Zeno pointed out that in that clip the doll was just sitting there sleeping. And I started to doubt whether or not that sleeping noise was as I suggested Garman and that perhaps it was just the doll and that all that time I'd somehow missed the doll being asleep there. But it turns out that, uh, yeah, on, on more than one occasion while recording this episode, I heard the sleeping noise, and the doll was not actually sleeping. So, I presume it's Garman. Uh, perhaps there are two different sleeping sounds, uh, sounds of people sleeping. Perhaps one belongs to the doll, one belongs to Garman. But I'm, I'm relatively certain that there is only one, and that it does only... It's only meant to suggests that Garman is sleeping, even though you can't find him anywhere in the Hunter's Dream. Uh, but still, very much appreciate you pointing out that possibility, Xenu, because I was not sure. Uh, Xenu posted another comment uh, about what she called the Beast-Formed Hunter in the DLC. Uh, the name of the Hunter per the guide that Xenu was referring to, uh, and that's the one in the Hunter's Nightmare who uh, is using the Beast Embrace Oath. S Zeno suggests that that beast is, or, or could be, Gilbert. Uh, the guide refers to this uh, NPC as the Bestial Hunter. And I, I think it's a very interesting idea, but I'm not sure if there's any evidence to suggest that that is, in fact, Gilbert beyond the fact that he's hanging out around what, what is Gilbert's house in the Waking World. Uh, and more to the point, because I, I do believe we have another comment that makes this suggestion, uh, Gilbert, I, I don't see how he could have become a blood drunk hunter, because it seems that, you know, he came as a foreigner to Yarnum, so he fits that, I guess, uh, requirement. But, uh, he seems to start having a, uh, problems with mobility and his health very early on. So, insofar as he, you know, was an active hunter, uh, he doesn't seem to have, like, when we find him, he's, he's more or less immobile. He, he says he would help us, but he can't in his current condition. So, I don't know when he would have uh, been, been pulled into the dream. Uh, he, and he didn't strike me, he struck me very much as a sane person, right up until he transforms into a beast. And recall that we are in the Hunter's Nightmare, not because we are blood drunk, 
But because we were carrying the eye of a hunter who was, or, or uh, was at, at whatever point, blood drunk. So the amygdala that picks us up and carries us to the hunter's nightmare does so unwittingly based on the fact that we have the eye in our possession. So they mistake it for our own eye and not, and it, it's not that we're carrying, it, it's not that we are blood drunk. Uh, and that's why Simon the Herald makes a point of pointing out and, and saying to us, oh, so you're another sane hunter. So just like Simon, we are there not as blood drunk hunters, but as sane quote unquote hunters. Uh, but I thought it was a very interesting uh, comment nevertheless, so thank you, Zinu. So High Endurance Ludes writes, in regards to the Ashen Amygdala corpse, it makes a bit more sense once you re reach the fishing village, uh, the, the fishing hamlet, uh, that is. Upon the realization that the entirety of Nightmare Yarnum is actually just a lower layer of the nightmare beneath the water, the geography of the dream world becomes a bit easier to understand. It can be theorized that the Nightmare Frontier is on an even higher plane of the Nightmare than the Fishing Village. You can see the tips of the ruined mass visible from above in the Frontier and on the same axis in the Koss Boss Room. Thus it can be reasoned that the mass you see in the distance in the Frontier may be these mass near, found near Koss. With this in mind, it may not be insane to postulate that a lesser amygdala uh, fell from the frontier and landed all the way down in Nightmare Yarnum. Uh, that is the Hunter's Nightmare. Essentially, the amygdala corpse coupled with the barnacle monsters that appear to fall out of nowhere all hint towards the concept of layers in the dream before it uh, becomes entirely blatant or apparent, I, I think you meant to say. Uh, or maybe from just thought it was an atmospheric asset, who knows. Read this somewhere on the subreddit, so hats, hats off to the good folks over yonder. So I did some searching trying to find the thread that Heindurns Ludes is referencing here, uh, and I couldn't find it. And so, uh, so although I'm not going to speak to the this theory uh, explicitly right now, because we don't have a lot of time for comments today, uh, I did want to ask kindly that if you're going to be referencing a you know something someone wrote somewhere else, that I would really really appreciate it if you could include links in your post. Although your post may initially get sent to the spam filter, uh, whenever that happens, I, I, you know, I check the comments regularly. And so even if I don't read your comment on the show, uh, you can rest assured that I've read and I appreciate all, all of you for commenting. And then I read every single comment that is made on my videos, uh, whether Bloodborne, Let's Talk Lore, or otherwise. Every single one I read. And though I don't have time to respond to all of them, nor do I have time to include all of them in the show. I appreciate them all. Uh, and with all that said, if you post something and you're afraid that, uh, you know, posting a link will put it into the spam filter, uh, it might, it, it likely will. But if I recognize your name as someone who has contributed in the past to the comment section and our discussion of the lore, or if I just recognize your name full stop and I see that you have a link in the spam filter, not only will I approve the link, but if, if I recognize your name as a trustworthy one, I will almost certainly add you to the list of approved commenters. So if you post a link, you won't have to wait a second time to have it go into the, uh, to have me approve it so that it can actually show up. So in short, don't be afraid to post links. In, in fact, I encourage it, highly encourage it because uh, it makes my life a little bit easier uh, in not having to actually go and search for references that people are made uh, are making. So, yeah, thank you, High Nerds Ludes. Nevertheless, uh, so to read a couple more, uh, uh, to read a little bit more about what Cassative or Theomeni wrote. Uh, first, the beast hunter in front of Gilbert's house, in my mind, uh, is in my mind Gilbert. The timeline does, doesn't quite match with him having the auto badge, but the time doesn't have to be one to one in the nightmare. Given that Gilbert suggests that he's both A, a foreigner, and B, a hunter, uh, and C, drops the claw mark rune, I figure that Gilbert, as a hunter, and dies, uh, enters the nightmare like all hunters, transforms into a, into a beast hunter. So again, uh, the bestial hunter, as, as I just covered, I, I don't believe that that's Gilbert. Um, and the primary reason for that is, is you know, beyond... I, I think that the evidence... 
the only real evidence for that is his positioning and that you know he does he doesn't seem he doesn't strike me as having either the mobility or as being drunk on blood he struck me he's always struck me as a very you know reasonable and uh even killed person uh particularly given the circumstances in which we find him so i don't know maybe that's just me but i'm interested in hearing what everyone else thinks uh, so, uh, Theo many points out, as others did, that the river of blood isn't a naturally occurring river, and that it comes from the corpses that litter the ground and have its spring in Ludwig's boss room. It's to symbolize that the foundation of the healing church stands on the corpses of hunters, hunters, and Yarnamites. So, uh, a, a very apt uh, summary of that which I, I attempted to articulate in much longer form earlier on, so thank you for that. The constable garb... Uh, Theomeni says is more of a sly wink nod to Jap well, Japan's own xenophobia and slyly makes fun of it. Well. It is almost universally uh, foreigners who are capital H hunters, Yarnamite hunters, other than the lo other than lowercase h hunters, which were ten a penny, were just a self-defense force of sort. It seems to be a vague cultural reference along these lines. Uh, beast patients. Uh, we already addressed that aspect of the, the comment earlier. So, I have a blood drunk hunter. Uh, few many thinks it's actually Ludwig's. If you notice his head, he's missing an eye on the player's left side. It's the same side he covers with the sword in the second phase cinematic. Plus, it's an eye that offers the hunt player uh, hunter guidance of a dubious private sword, as it is the key into the nightmare. So, interesting. Finally, as an aside, this places new emphasis on why the Yarnum Sunrise ending is considered a bad ending. In my opinion, that while G-Man tells the truth and releases your character from the Hunter's Dream, the player character Hunter is doomed to the Nightmare now forever, if they didn't pass directly into the Nightmare from the Dream. I also don't think that there's any evidence to suggest that uh, Hunters go to the Nightmare after the Dream. Um, I think that the Yarnum Sunrise ending... Uh, yeah, it's it's because, you know, there are two characters in the game who, as far as we can tell, uh, you know, all of the evidence suggests and is consistent with the fact that, that Eileen and Jura both got the quote-unquote Yarnum Sunrise ending and then went to do things in the waking world as mortal beings. Um, you know, you can make a case, given Eileen's uh, dialogue in the alternate ending to her quest line, that perhaps she herself was drunk with blood. <laughs> Few hunters can resist the intoxication of the hunt. Look at you. Just the same as all the rest. The hunters must die. The nightmare must end. Only I can stop this madness. The hunt makes hunters mad. <laughs> the beasts cannot be stopped! What well, good hunters now? Your blood is mine! A hunter's blood for me! Your punishment is death! Enough of this terrible dream! <laughs> uh, you monsters! All hunters must die. <laughs> she, she seems to, yeah, have succumbed to, you know, her thirst for blood. So, uh, I don't know. It just, it seems to me that that amygdala, for whatever reason, that's hanging outside the Uden Chapel, serves a regulatory function, and that, it, you know, you pick up a hunter, if the hunter has an eye, so whether it's theirs or not, that, you know, suggests they're drunk with blood, then it takes them to the hunter's nightmare. I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that, that the uh, pale blood hunters pass directly from the hunter's dream into the hunter's nightmare. So Dean Blake makes an interesting, a couple interesting points, in particular with uh, Redgrave and I were discussing, trying to figure out why it is that some of the hunters disappear when they die, 
Uh, so those that I and the guide describe as old hunters and those who just kind of, you know, turn to ragdolls. And uh, Dean points out very aptly that the corpses of the hunters in the nightmare disappear so that they can be revived to continue their eternal hunt. It wouldn't be much of an eternal punishment if they just had to die once and it was over, would it? So yeah, uh, really well put, really, really well put, because, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the whole idea, at least as far as I'm concerned, is, you know, forcing this perpetual trauma upon them and that they're being forced to relive it over and over and over again. So in that context, uh, it's not even necessary to talk about the respawn mechanic for the old hunters as being, as they're just being more of them. It's entirely possible to suggest that those are individual hunters and that they respawn simply by virtue of the fact that they are forced, as several of the item descriptions suggest, to relive the memory, to re relive and re-experience their trauma over and over and over again, forevermore. Dean goes on to say that the the uh, Nightmare Executioners wield a huge version of Ludwig's rifle and an axe with inscriptions on it similar to the Kirkhammer, further solidifying a connection to the Healing Church and perhaps a connection to Ludwig rather than Logarius. So this is also rather apt because, uh, as we pointed out uh, earlier on, the, the they're not actually wielding a large version of Ludwig's rifle, but the weapon they have is actually the church cannon, uh, which we picked up at the bottom of the elevator after getting Lawrence's skull, uh, human skull. And uh, yeah, as several of the other posters pointed out, it would seem that uh, Ludwig was an executioner proper based on his garb, but also based on the fact that we find the Nightmare Executioners outside of his, uh, outside of his boss room. Um, and Dean also goes on to say that he seems to regain his hunter composure in the second half of his fight, and his dialogue seems to suggest that he has been searching for the Moonlight Greatsword in the Nightmare, and having found it, gains the strength to, or at least partially suppress his beastly impulses. And that's a very apt way of putting it, because, um, Interestingly enough, in his first form, he actually is weak to serrated weapons. So there's a beast damage bonus when you're using, uh, you know, weapons that have a uh, that do bonus damage against beasts. Uh, he's susceptible to it as Ludwig the Accursed. In the second phase, however, as Ludwig the Holy Blade, you do not receive any such damage bonus. So that's very interesting and a really wonderful way, once again, where we see this synthesis of gameplay and lore. So yeah, thank you, Dean, for uh, several of your insights. Steven Swartz points out that the Guidance Rune says Ludwig saw tiny beings of light and was certain that these playful dancing sprites offered guidance. If you look cl closely when you're hit, you see what could easily be described as tiny dancing sprites that I believe lasts as long as you can rally from that hit. Although I could be wrong about that. No, you were absolutely right about that. Could those be what he was seeing? After all, being able to regain health after taking damage would certainly help me lessen my fears in such a dangerous situation. And uh, so as I said, or at least as I ought to have said to Steven, and there was someone else who pointed out something similar as well, that this is actually brilliant because it, it really does again, tied together the gameplay and the lore in, in a really wonderful way. So you see here that when I, uh, you know, use a blood bullet or when, when I draw blood bullets, you can see after the, the initial, you know, red of the blood, you can see the tiny dancing sprites that, yeah, is very, very consistent. So if you have the guidance rune on, uh, if I'm recalling the item description correctly, they're there, they remain there for longer. And that makes a lot of sense. It really does tie together the story and the mechanics of the rune in a wonderful way. Just for the sake of being exhaustive, uh, I was thinking about other tiny dancing sprites that we see throughout the game. Um, and so in addition to that which you see after you get hit, when you are still able to uh, achieve regain. There's also when you warp, 
you can see little black, tiny little black dancing sprites, perhaps abyssal sprites, that kind of, and, and I believe this is the same whether you're warping into the Chalice Dungeons, whether you're warping into the Waking World, uh, or back to the Hunter's Dream, uh, that you always see these tiny little dancing sprites. Uh, in addition to that, there are also little dancing sprites that we find around the lamps. And there were one or two more that uh, I've since forgotten, but those were the ones that stood out most to me. But I, I really do like Steven's idea uh, that, yeah, you see these tiny beings of light when that is very consistent with how the Guidance Rune actually works. So I don't know what that means in terms of the storyline, and uh, but it's just, yeah, I thought that that was a really interesting way of tying everything together. So Cody Chicken pointed out that uh, while sitting on the Bloodborne title menu, the opening cutscene, uh, when the opening cutscene plays, at the end of it we see the hunter exploring what looks like a chalice dungeon, and then he or she finds a skull that looks exactly like Lawrence's. When they reach out to touch it, a cleric beast begins to rise up from behind him or her. Has it been hinted at all along that Lawrence is a cleric beast? It's entirely possible. Entirely possible. I think the, the simplest answer would probably be that the Cleric Beast, perhaps at some point during development, was meant to be the boss that we fight in the Grand Cathedral. Um, and that this is probably just, you know, kind of harkening back to an earlier version of the game when they made that cinematic. But it's entirely possible that we were initially intended to fight Lawrence as a cleric beast in the Grand Cathedral. So while I'm almost certain that this that, that cinematic is just kind of referring to cut content, uh, it's entirely possible that the cut content included that revelation that Lawrence was, in fact, a cleric beast. Um, and that maybe, you know, for the sake of the network test, they wanted to have a boss like the cleric beast with really complex mechanics on the Great Bridge, but it is entirely possible that the seeds were sown for this DLC a long time ago. So Krishna Bola writes that, uh, I wanted to present the idea of the brain fluid being the fluid the doll bleeds, seeing as though Lady Maria, Lady Maria has the connection to the research hall that has all the brain fluids, and the doll is a recreation of Maria, maybe the brain fluid is what Garman used to animate the doll. So the brain fluid and, you know, pale blood and all that stuff is, is something that we're going to be talking about uh, in much greater detail later on. But for the time being, I wanted to point out that uh, it's not, uh, Garman isn't, isn't responsible for animating the doll. Uh, that the doll is alive in the nightmare as a result of or, sorry, alive in the hunter's dream as a result of it being the hunter's dream. Uh, as as a result of its situatedness within the dreamlands as opposed to the waking world. Um, why she bleeds and why she bleeds that particular color substance is another matter. And it may very well be brain fluid. Uh, but that's something that we're going to have to talk about a little bit later on. Uh, but I, yeah, for now, I just wanted to point it out that I don't believe that... Garman has anything to do explicitly with having animated the doll. I think that's just something that happened in the Hunter's Dream, based on kind of who Garman is and the fact that he created the doll to begin with. But you know, he didn't like open up her head and pour the brain fluid in and then say abracadabra and then the doll was alive. Uh, it's just that's just kind of how it turned out when the Hunter's Dream was conceived. And on that note, uh, Babel uh, wrote an interesting comment uh, suggesting that the doll is the host of the Hunter's Dream and not Garmin, and that the Mensis ritual was or orchestrated for the acquisition of a third, third umbilical cord. Uh, so on the first one, I'll just say that again, uh, I'm not sure that it really matters all that much who the host of a nightmare is, because and, and I think, I suspect that that is probably a translation quirk, the, the word host. And uh, I seem to recall that uh, JSF had 
done a you know an analysis of that but I, I can't recall whether or not that is in fact the case uh, so I'll leave it up to any of you to correct me if I'm wrong but I think it means something other than you know what is implied when you say the word host and so case in point Mikolash as the host of the nightmare you would think that you know after we kill him and you know we enter the nightmare from his body but after we kill him, the nightmare still persists. So, you know, I I don't I don't really uh, I don't really think it's necessary to assign a host. You know, to assign to say that this person is the host or that person is the host. Uh, in the case of Mikolash, uh, I think it's just there to let you know that this is the person responsible, the person most responsible for having beckoned and, and, and conceived of this nightmare, but that it's not necessarily that the nightmare follows all of the, you know, it's not that it, it was conceived from inside of Mikolash's consciousness. It's just that he was he's the person chiefly responsible for bringing it into being. Uh, regarding Mensis, Babel writes that we know the formula for ascending to a great one is three third chords, and the immense blood echoes obtained from defeating a great one. I think it's pretty clear that the scholars in Mensis knew that knew this formula too, since the notes left in the lecture hall talk about evolution, three third chords, and hunting the great ones. We know that Mensis retrieved a chord from Queen Nyarnum slash Mergo, and that another was possibly found with Cos's carcass. This only leaves one chord and the great one blood echoes before Mensis could ascend a human being. Beckoning, beckoning a great one would provide them with another chord if they could attempt a pregnancy, as well as a source of immense blood echoes. Mensis got closer than anybody to true ascension. Uh, I don't, I don't dispute that. That's interesting. Um, I will, I will say that um, for my own benefit, uh, to ensure that I don't get confused, this is something that you know I'm, I'm working on a map currently, for lack of a better way of putting it. So similar to the rest of the diagrams that I've done in the context of this playthrough. Uh, to kind of figure out the the chords and you know to kind of put all of these pieces together uh, the the guide has a few very helpful maps of that sort but even then I feel like they're a bit too trepidatious and you know a bit like some of the wording that they even you know on the one hand it's a bit trepidatious but on the other hand they use some really strong wording that I don't necessarily agree with so uh, we'll have to return to this a little bit later but I wanted to acknowledge this comment for now so thank you Babel so finally we have a comment from IRLFC9 who writes that uh, my view on Bloodborne and its larger meaning has switched several times since it was first released when it comes to gameplay and narrative, I can't help but feel that Miyazaki would be aware of a term, critical term like ludonarrative dissonance, basically meaning that gameplay, uh, gameplay that is not in sync with the narrative themes you were trying to get across, a term that has been in the gaming lexicon for some time now. I think it's safe to assume that whatever core me game mechanic Miyazaki chose in his game, it must reflect the greater meaning he was trying to get across in his work. Which is why I'm so surprised that the hunting that hunting is such a derogatory term in the narrative, while being impossible to get any ending, let alone transcendent ending, without doing some hunting yourself, and without uh, any horrific ending. But on the other hand, the doll does call you a hunter as a term of endearment, even when you transcend into a great one. Which begs questions: Are hunters inherently evil, or as long as you don't end up blood drunk? which they almost all end up being, is perfectly fine to be a hunter and is in fact needed to transcend. I know Hemingway actually believed hunting actually allowed men to transcend their deep-seated troubles in a way that sitting around researching your problems in universities would not. Then again, to be a great hunter, you need to uh, be able to study your prey, both in real life and in this game. You can't sit around and think all the time, uh, but you can't let your beastly reflexes take complete control as well. I don't know yet, maybe it's just as simple as stay balanced. And uh, IRL added a, an edit to say, having thought about it, the greater theme of the game to me is really drives home the abyssal depth of struggles and horrors it takes just for humanity to move into a stable place. It's a very modernist thought process that you need the horrors, learn these lessons to evolve. Think about what had to happen to get to the point where you have three umbilical cords in front of the moon presence. A lot of people had to suffer and die. A lot of research ended up in dead ends and a lot of seemingly needless fighting had to happen. 
there is no way around the monumental effort needed to improve a species in this cold, harsh universe. Uh, so I will say that, um, on the one hand, I'm, I'm, you know, it's an interesting perspective, especially the the last bit added with the edit, uh, but that I don't think it's necessary to have, you know. Uh, because what 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 you're essentially describing, and and I know that this isn't necessarily what you believe, but what you're describing is somewhat of a, a teleological perspective on history. That you know we have all these great things now, but the only way we can, we were able to get those things is by you know having people suffer and having people get hurt, and you know to do all of these things that happened is to me not really true and and in the context of bloodborne specifically i think that if that is the message that they're trying to get across the message in my view would be that ultimately it doesn't matter what a single person does that you know to a certain degree we're all we're all beholden to larger and more powerful interests than us that we can only make do with what we have and that there is a certain you know there are conditions of possibility there's a range of possible outcomes and actions that we can take but we are severe, severely limited by our, our personal circumstance and the power structures within which we're embedded uh, but before I, I go any further I'll just read um, the definition of ludonarrative dissonance from Wikipedia to anyone who's lost. So ludonarrative dissonance refers to the conflicts between a video game's narrative and its gameplay. The term was coined by Clint Hawking, a former creative director at LucasArts, on his blog in October 2007. He coined the term in response to the game Bioshock, which according to him promotes the theme of self-interest through its gameplay while promoting the opposing theme of selflessness through its narrative creating a violation of aesthetic distance that often pulls the player out of the game. And so in the context of Bloodborne, that is, I think, something that is, on the one hand, kind of a problem, but on the other hand, if we look at this graph that we discussed last week, you could perhaps place, you know, you could perhaps place a label in the part of the this this chart that contains gameplay mechanics and no narrative the necessary component on the bottom that you could perhaps place ludo narrative dissonance there that to a certain degree there needs to be some amount of ludo narrative dissonance that you cannot eliminate it completely because again you are playing a video game um, but on the other hand there are games like undertale that exists where you could go through the entire game and not kill an enemy. And so I've not played Undertale myself, but I've you know I've watched a couple of let's plays of it and I will put a link in the description below to a short review of the game from one of my favorite YouTubers uh, Lazy Game Reviews or LGR. And yeah, it's it, he he articulates it much better than I could what is so wonderful about the game, but just that you know you can uh, to use a, a phrase that I learned a long time ago, you can kill with kindness, so to speak. So rather than killing, you can kill with kindness, and, and you can get through the game in that way. And so that is really something that I think would be interesting to see added to the Souls games, uh, would be some, some way of going about doing a pacifist run in the game. And you could make it perhaps more difficult than you know a normal one, and I'm sure it would be, uh, but I think that that would provide, you know, a much, much larger range of possibilities for the player and is something that, that could go a long way to addressing the, the problems of ludonarrative dissonance. But yeah, to, to bring it back to my original comment, um, I think that this, that view is somewhat prevalent that, you know, we, if we want to advance, if we want to ascend, that people have to suffer that you can that you know you can look at people suffering as a you know as necessary collateral damage and so i've talked a lot about neoliberalism in the context of this playthrough and this is precisely what neoliberalism is about 
the view that inequality is not a problem to be addressed, but it's a natural state, a, a natural outcome of a well-functioning market. That in order for one person to succeed, another person has to fail. It's a zero-sum game. There can be no cooperative successes. And I don't know what that would look like in the real world, the cooperative successes. I don't know what it would look like in the context of Bloodborne. But it is something that uh, I believe, you know, with every fabric of my being, it's possible to be cooperative as opposed to adversarial. Uh, and that it's not a possibility that we should be closed off to. But in the context of Bloodborne, it just seems to me that, yeah, what Miyazaki and, and his team at FromSoft are trying to get across with the story, and this is, this is also true to a large extent in Dark Souls 2, in my view, that, yeah, that those stories that we hear, the individual hero stories about people who change the world by themselves, that they're largely untenable and, and not true because we're all subject. No one is exempt from, you know, the structures of power that exist around us. Uh, but yeah, if I've not lost you already, I very much appreciate all of you um, a whole lot because it's been about six months since I've had uh, any substantial viewer base on this channel. And I hope you know how, how wonderful an experience this has been for me and uh, that I hope it will continue to be a wonderful experience for me and more importantly for you as well. And I hope that you all having a fantastic holiday season, that you find some time for rest and relaxation, that you uh, are able to, you know, spend some time with your loved ones and the people that you cherish. And don't forget to tell them how much you cherish them as well. And on that note, I hope you all know how much I cherish you and your comments and your feedback. And uh, yeah, just for being you. So thank you very much for joining me. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Uh, someone help me. I'm guilty. I know. But I won't do it again. I promise. The dumb darkness. It it frightens me. And what rises from its very depths. <laughs>